Some songs are joyful and happy and clappy and hopeful and exciting. And some, song, some songs uh, express other emotions that people face. God gives us in the Psalms experiences and songs of all different emotions. Reminds me of an article that I read recently by Carl Truman. What do miserable Christians sing? He argues there that we're not always going through good times. And sometimes there are songs that need to be sung in the minor key. And if you notice even from our time of worship today, songs like It Is Well With My Soul or Hallelujah, Love Divine or Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy or even the special music that we just heard that pointed us to the grace of God through difficult trials. Very fitting. Very fitting for a series that we're in here dealing with downcast experiences even in the Christian life. And this is weighty. One of the mysterious experiences of public preaching ministry is that preachers never know what is going on in his listeners' hearts and minds when he's preaching. That's right, I'm talking about all of you out there right now. I don't have a clue where you're at on any given Sunday. You have the advantage. And though I can get a glimpse into your lives as your pastor, as you share with me what's going on, I don't know exactly where you're at today or any other day, including right now. And as I've been preaching this series titled Downcast, I've been really just acutely reminded about that reality. I've also been uniquely conscientious about each and every one of you. I've been praying for you by name, thinking about you and your known and unknown hardships and experiences and trials in life. And each and every word I utter from this pulpit always is just so weighty to me But there's something about this sermon that has had me in prayer and my heart going out to each of you, submitted even desperately to the hands of our Heavenly Father for help and direction. And to that end, I want us to go before our Heavenly Father in prayer for help together. Father, you are so good And you know each and every one of us. Lord, even if I don't, you know us all. You know what we've gone through this past week, this past year, even this morning. You know how we're feeling. You know us, Lord. So would you minister to each of us in unique ways that only you can do? Would you shed the light of your hope and grace in ways that only you can do, O Lord? Would you do that, Lord? Would you help us in these things? We say this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there's no easy way to say this. But circumstances in life can lead some, sadly, to such deep and dark places that they even feel helpless hopeless, downcast, and despairing. Unable to see the future because of the pain of the present. Unable to take one more step or even one more breath. That is how serious this problem could be in some of our lives. You might respond now, Well, I've been sad before, even a little anxious at times, but I've never come to those depths. Praise God for that, if that's you. Praise God. But other people have. 
And other people do get to that place. And I hope that the take home from our first two sermons and then even this one today is that we would have some understanding and awareness of the deep, dark, and hard problems that people face. Maybe that's you. Spurgeon recounts that he was once preaching a sermon about the dark depths of the soul. Remember, Spurgeon himself experienced deep and dark depression in his life. And a gentleman came up to him after preaching the following week and said to him, I never before in my life heard any man speak who seemed to know my heart. Mine is a terrible case. But on Sunday morning, you painted me to the life and preached as if you had been inside my soul. Spurgeon recounted this in one of his books, and he wrote, By God's grace, I saved that man from suicide and led him into the gospel light and liberty. But I know I could not have done it if I had not myself been confined confined in the dungeon in which he lay. Listen, church, even if you haven't been in that dungeon yourself, and I know that not all have, please, would you do all you can to learn from the downcast so that you might know how to care and pray and love those who have or those who are in that dungeon. Could you imagine being in that dungeon as Spurgeon talks about? If you've never been there, it's a terrible experience. Remember, Spurgeon said this, the mind can descend far lower than the body, for in it there are bottomless pits. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more, but the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. And even though I don't know where each and every one of you are at exactly, I do know some experience deep, dark sorrow and even despair. Please, know that I see you and even plead to God on your behalf in prayer for help and hope for you to continue on through the hardships that I know that you're facing. And though we have dealt with depression and anxiety already in this series, which of course is related to the topic of despair, I think that we need to further seek compassion, awareness, and understanding together This morning, which, as I give you the outline, is our first point, and then provide practical care for others, which will be our second point, and then lastly even, as we've been anticipating so far in the series, look to God's provision of lament in Scripture, which is oftentimes neglected and even unknown to Christians. You may have never even really thought about what lament is, We're going to look at that in our third point. And so there's our outline for us as we move forward. And so as we see on the screen, let's start with point number one, the experience of despair. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 88 in verse 1. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand." You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. This psalm was written by Haman, the Ezraite. And the entire psalm, if we went on and read it through to the end in Psalm 88, 
get this, it continues on in that note of sadness, heart-wrenching, dark tones throughout the whole entire psalm. It never brightens up. As the chancellor or uh, president of Reformed Theological Seminary, Ligon Duncan put it so tenderly in his book, his book titled, When Pain is Real and God Seems Silent, he said this, have you ever assumed that mature believers always have their prayers answered? Have you ever thought that godly men and women don't endure suffering? Well, the Bible teaches just the opposite. Sometimes even mature, godly believers, believers like Haman, the Ezraite, feel as if their cries for help go unheard by our Lord. Or we can add great men of God like Job or Joseph as well, who cried out to God. Last week, I quickly mentioned them as examples of mature Christians who learned the secret of contentment through good times and bad times, like the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4. And by that quick statement, it could almost come off like the whole process of trusting God through trials is easy. Please hear me now. It's not easy. Rather, it's excruciating. Job lost children. They were here one day, gone the next, due to a tragedy. Unthinkable. His wife basically told him, she told him to curse God and die because of his many trials, physical health trials, suffering, tragedy upon tragedy. And Job was not always doing well. At times in his life, he was even despairing to be sure. Job chapter 7 and verses 13 through 15 says this. When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, verse 15, so that I would choose strangling and death rather than my bones. Biblical characters went through terrible things. And then consider Joseph even as an example. Sold into slavery initially, being left in a pit to die by his own family, betrayed by people who he helped in prison, falsely accused of impropriety by Potiphar's wife. None of these things that Job or Joseph went through was light and easy. Far be it to even think that. Life in a fallen world is hard. Life after the fall is hard. Believers experience immense trials and suffering, even bringing them to the pits of despair itself. Or consider Elijah. If you remember after the battle between God and the prophets of Baal, remember there was a test given? <laughs> Who's going to pass the test? Who can, who can do this? And remember that the false prophets failed and that the true God won the day, and that the fake idol God Baal was exposed, and Elijah was vindicated, and his God was put on display as the one true God. What a miraculous day in biblical history. But did you know even after that great victory, and then after running for his life, Elijah then was found under a tree despairing his own very life itself. Let's read the story together from 1 Kings chapter 19 and verses 1 to 5 for us to get a glimpse of what was going on here. Verse 9, chapter 19 and verse 1 says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Ahab put a hit on Elijah. Verse 3. Then he was afraid. Elijah was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, 
which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Elijah was so bad off that he wanted God to take his life. That's despairing, isn't it? He had to have an angel bring him a meal for crying out loud to help him in his time of need. Life is not easy. Struggles happen. Christians even struggle in deep and dark ways. Did you see it just now from the scriptures? We can add to this list of biblical characters even people in this room right now. Members of our church who have gone through or are right now going through very hard and dark seasons and trials. Believers struggle with these experiences of despair, and it's not easy. So don't take my encouragement towards contentment that we saw last week as a trite band-aid to put on your excruciating wound. And if you struggle in these ways, oh, my heart goes out to you. And, and, and even if you haven't struggled in these ways, remember that others have. These are all really hard and serious problems. I hope you can see that. Oh, I hope you can see how difficult this can be for some. And even if you're here and you've never gone through anything like this, you're just hearing this series and you're like, wow, this is really heavy. Take it down a notch, Pastor. I want you to remember to please have some humility that you are not the only person in this world or in this church or on this earth. And even as we saw here in a few biblical examples, and there are more, that other Christians can even face these dark times of despair, the dark night of the soul. I want you also to be honest and humble, but honest about the reality that you don't know the future. Just yesterday, my kids were running down the street to get me, my older kids, because my youngest, Noah, almost a year old, was choking and Stacy was trying to get a hold of me. I just had left to come to the church to finalize and work on the finishing up the sermon and I missed her call. So the kids were running down to get me because it was that serious. I missed the call and, and Noah wasn't doing well. Now, you probably think that we are the worst Parents, because I've mentioned choking, even recently kids choking a few times from the pulpit, but bear with me, for those of you who could think back to this time, almost one year old, uh, as the little ones start crawling around and they want to just put everything into their mouths, hopefully you could remember this potential danger even in your context, but this time it was really, really serious and I rushed back home, praise God, the Lord spared his life, praise God. The choking ceased. But we were all shook up. It was scary. And I cannot imagine what would have happened if we lost that little guy choking to death. People lose babies like that. Or people lose family in car accidents or to cancer or even to the tragic problem of despair and its consequences? Do you have a heart that's aware of those real possibilities in life outside the garden, in life of sin and consequences of sin and the results and the effects of the fall? How do we know what will happen and how we will handle the untold trials ahead for us when you have some humility? Or how do you know how things will change as you age and 
you grow older, you don't know what the future holds for you. So that should give you a kind of humility. If we were in the garden, everything was perfect, we wouldn't have to worry about any problems and we could just go around happy-go-lucky, no issues, no discouragement, no frustrations, no trials, no suffering. But we're not in that state, are we? We're not. I've heard and learned from others who have had at one point in their lives been completely unknown to these suffering trials. They were peachy keen. If you've ever heard that saying, everything was fine for them, everything's okay. They never struggled with serious depression or anxiety, but things change. Life happens. And one surgery to another, and then there's chronic suffering and pain, or unexpected trials and tragedies happen, or careers fall apart, or the experience of unthinkable trauma of abuse occurs, or backbreaking anxiety and panic attacks happen for the first time for someone, and the fear of another one just round the corner for someone who's ever experienced something so difficult like that as an example, which, by the way, I heard this past week a testimony of a lady sharing that panic attacks for her, and she would know as she's had children, uh, she says the experience of that is worse than labor pains. Now, who wants to be worrying about something like that potentially overtaking them at any given moment? This is just terrible things that people can face in this fallen world. And whatever may lead someone to this place of despair... I just want us to see it's all really serious and very sad. And we need to have hearts that break for people in this place. And to be humble that we don't know our future. And realize like Zach Eswines helpfully shows compassionately in his book, Spurgeon Sorrows, what he calls the sanity of despair. Meaning, if you only walked in their shoes, you'd get it too. You'd see the trials and difficulty. You realize all the reasons for these feelings of sadness that other people like Heman or Job or Joseph or Elijah or maybe even friends and family that you know have an experience themselves. And if we don't struggle in these ways, I want us to be a lifeline and a help for those who do. And who knows, church, We may need them in the future in this unpredictable, fallen world that we live in. And on that note, this leads us to our next point. And number two, caring for the hopeless. Look with me in your Bibles to Psalm 34, verses 17 through 18. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. The encouraging truth of Psalm 34 and the rest of the Bible is that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and the downcast. But sadly, oftentimes, even some people in churches are not. One of the greatest helps that you can give the hopeless and despairing is compassionate understanding and willingness to be there as a true friend for them. But too many are harsh. Too many are ignorant to the experiences people have going on around them in a fallen world. Too many Christians even make matters worse. But having understanding and humility and compassion can go a long way. I want to encourage you all. Put yourselves in their shoes. Jesus did. Consider Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, God the Son took on flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
He lived in a fallen world and experiences challenges in this fallen world, and he knows us. He sympathizes with us because he's been there, he's been betrayed, he's felt alone, and he's experienced excruciating inner and outer pain. So if we're gonna be like Jesus, we should also be seeking to provide help and hope and care for others in their time of need as well. You see that? Do you sympathize with others? Do you have eyes filled with tears and compassion over other people's sorrows and trials? Or are you kind of just checked out? I think our culture and our sin has made it almost impossible for us to be there for one another. I mean, we don't know what it is to mourn, do we? or to be sad for others, or to cry with suffering people, or to cry and be sad when we're suffering even. Because we're so uncomfortable with negative and sad feelings, if we're honest. So would you be honest with yourself? How do you deal with hard emotions and feelings, whether they're your own or that of someone else? Realizing your weakness in this area which I believe a lot of us have, if we're honest. It's a good thing so we can work on being there for hurting people, even if it doesn't really come naturally to us, even if it makes us feel awkward, even if it makes us want to run away and avoid the situation. We need to be aware of that. So where are you at? Because God doesn't give us an out on this. He doesn't say, well, if it's not your personality, and if you're simply uncomfortable with sadness and pain and suffering, then you can just disregard the need to bear burdens, as Galatians 6 says. No, God doesn't say that. Not at all. Consider Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now, we do a great job at rejoicing and having fun with happy feelings and those who have joyful experiences themselves. We do okay with that for the most part. Of course, there's always situations when some get jealous and some can't even be happy for people, but you know what I mean by that. It's easier to be happy with happy people. But what about the second half of that command? to weep with those who weep. I think we can use some help in this area, can't we? I know I can work on it, can you? We need to be there for hurting people because God commands us to be like him in helping hurting people, to have his heart, as Christians I'm talking, and to have the heart of Christ towards hurting people. If you're a believer, you should have the heart of Christ towards hurting people. People, not to gossip about them for not having their act together. Not to shun them and avoid them when they come by because you think they're just a little high maintenance for you. But to seek to do good to them, to love them, to know them, to mourn with them, to not only be happy with happy people, but to be sad with sad people. How are you with that? If you're just terrible at it, God doesn't just say, okay, you're off the hook. He says, weep with those who weep. It's for all of us. So we need to work on biblical mourning and sadness with people who are going through hard times. We need to enter into that minor key with them. Whether because of their external circumstances or internal deep and dark hardships of depression and anxiety, and if that's you, please let us in. Let a trusted person in so we can be there for you and help bear your burdens because we might not know if that's where you're at. Let somebody know you trust. And if you all take away one thing from this sermon series, please take away 
a softer heart for hurting people. And act by what you've heard, by actually loving and caring and understanding and weeping with those dear saints who are in a place of weeping at any given time in their lives. And if you struggle with that, this leads us to our third and final point, and number three, learning to lament. Psalm 42, 5a says this, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Now, it's fitting that this series theme, Psalm 42, Psalm 42, just so happens to be a lament psalm. Now, I've anticipated this topic earlier in the series, but like I mentioned before, you may have never even heard of this idea of lament from Scripture ever in your entire lives. And if you look now at the image of the screen, um, you'll see there multiple categories of the 150 psalms broken out into different uh, areas on the screen. And notice that the largest group of psalms are lament psalms. Psalm 42 is in this category, and that's the blue category on the screen. If you can't see the words, they're a little small, but the blue category there are lament psalms, and it shows all the different psalms if you look up close. Then you have other types of psalms like praise psalms or trust or thanksgiving or wisdom or hymns and then royal psalms all broken out there for you to see. But I want you to see over one third of the psalms fall into this category of lament, including Psalm 88 that we saw in our first point and even including Psalm 139 that we recently saw in our Sanctity of Life series last month. Because in precatory psalms, as we saw then, it falls into this category of lament as well. But what is lament? Well, I will discuss and define it a bit with help from an excellent book I read this past week on the topic by Mark Bergop, titled Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. If you remember a few years ago, Pastor Wood spent an entire sermon on this topic from Psalm 77 that he just read in the call to worship. And he was able to share much more than I'm going to be able to share with you in this final point. So I commend to you again Wood's sermon as a real helpful explanation of the things we're going to quickly look at today. Mark wrote this book out of tremendous pain he and his wife experienced themselves of losing their child in the womb just days before she was due. Mark said, about 24 hours after hearing the crushing news, I held the nine-pound baby of my lifeless daughter, Sylvia. As I cradled her, swaddled in the hospital blanket, I longed for her to wake up. Her fully developed body looked so normal but there was no breathing. She was beautiful, but not alive. And through this terrible sorrow, you see, Mark questioned himself, asking, how would my boys respond to this level of sadness? Or would my wife ever be happy again? What if we never conceived another child? And how can I live with this pain while feeling the need to have it all together as I pastor to church, he said. Or would our marriage make it? Now this tragic suffering Mark experienced, and he recounts in this book, I know is in the genre of suffering that many here at our church have experienced themselves to even greater or lesser Degrees, And no matter the severity of your trials, I want you to learn today quickly what he learned. As Mark found in the Psalms and in lament in Scripture, help through his helplessness and suffering. He wrote, the Bible gave voice to my pain. 
and said, lament helped us navigate the wilderness of our grief. But Mark soon found out what many sufferers find and what we just discussed in our last point, that not everybody knows how to weep with those who weep. He said, finding an explanation or quick solution for grief, while an admirable goal, can circumvent the opportunity afforded in lament. That is, to give a person permission to wrestle with sorrow instead of rushing to end it. Walking through sorrow without understanding and embracing the God-given song of lament can stunt the grieving process. So what is lament? Mark Vergop put it like this. Lament can be defined as a loud cry, a howl, or a passionate expression of grief. Put simply, lament is prayer in pain that leads to trust. And you know these from the Psalms, don't you? How long, O oh Lord, we see over and over again. Or why do you stand far away? Or where are you? You know these from the Psalms. And all of these psalms that we saw on the screen under that blue category are prayers or songs of crying out to God in lament. It's all over the scriptures. As Mark put it, lament is how you live between the poles of a hard life and trusting in God's sovereignty. And also, lament is how Christians grieve. And he also said, all people cry, but only Christians lament. This is a Christian thing. We need to grab a hold of it. And as we admitted before, we are terrible at grieving ourselves and caring for hurting people and mourning and hurting dear loved ones in front of us. Why? Because I think we've ignored this theme of lament from Scripture. If we only leaned more into Scripture for a biblical world and life view and experience, we would know what it is to lament because it's all over the Bible. And since time is limited, I'm just going to give you the big picture that I gleaned from further diving into the study of the topic of lament this past uh, few weeks. I think Mark walks through the stages of lament well, so I will give you the four steps or stages of lament, and then we're going to see it from Psalm 42 as a whole. So first, you'll see on the screen, we need to continue to go to God in prayer even when times are terrible, or especially when times are terrible. Second, we need to make our complaints even known to God. This is biblical, church. This may seem crazy to you, but Scripture shows us, even approvingly, that the process takes place in those who are grieving and lamenting. And part of this terrible struggle going through suffering includes bringing our struggles and complaints to God because he knows. He's God. And if we're struggling, telling God, even in complaint form, where we are at is actually biblical. We're going to do that in a reverent way. We're not going to, you know, be rude and angry and say sinful things to God uh, per se, but we can let God know the suffering in our life that he knows, and we will see it even in Psalm 42, a picture of what that looks like, and we've already seen it so far. So go to God in prayer, and then two, bring your complaints to him, and then third, ask boldly. We see this in the Lament Psalms. Or make our request to God confidently known to him in prayer. Or maybe even doing that for somebody else who's in the process of suffering. Ask boldly for that dear suffering saint. Ask for help from God. And then fourth, choose to trust God. That's how Mark helpfully sums it up. And I think it's just pretty straightforward, more to be said, but helpful for us to have a grid when we look at the lament psalms. 
And I want you to notice that there's a progression here and that all aspects here are important and biblical. You don't want to just skip any of them. Some people want to skip the hard, terrible times and just jump right to the trust times. But the lament psalm gives us a whole picture here that I think is just so important for us and our suffering. If you've ever felt downcast, and I know that many of you have, or if you're right now feeling hopeless for a variety of reasons, I hope you can learn from the blessing of lament through trials and hardships and frustrations. And in our next prayer service, even coming up on the evening of September 11th, we will have an opportunity to lament together as a church. We will lament using scripture as our guide and as our example. We will lament those who are downcast in life, and we can add other requests, even as we recently went through our Sanctity of Life series, we could lament the reality, the sad reality of the loss of pre-born babies' lives or other things that are ailing us and struggles that we have. We can bring our suffering before the Lord, and we can lament together. So I encourage all of us to make that a priority to come to that evening prayer service so we can be there, pray for each other, and put these things into practice. Make it a priority because we need it. And realize this, it's not only helpful for those who are struggling personally with lament, but it's a blessing for others to pray and lament on behalf of other people suffering as well. That's a gracious thing, and our evening prayer service can facilitate that. We look forward to that together. Seems weird that we would look forward to mourn and lament, but we just need it, and there's something special that God does to dear saints when they go to him in these times of lament. He helps us, he meets us, he cares for us, he lifts us up. We feel empowered, emboldened, and helped in our time of need. So back to Psalm 42, quickly as our example from our series in our text, I want us to see really quick what this looks like in the passage uh, and theme of our series. Psalm 42, 1 through 6 says this, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Nazar. Do you see the struggle the psalmist expresses there in Scripture? Do you see the anguish and the tears? Certainly here, we see both going to God in prayer and also making his complaints known before God. He's like, God, I'm distressed. And I'm even crying so much that my tears become a meal. It's so bad and I'm so sad. And then other people are even mocking me, asking about where in the world you are at, God. Where is he at? They're asking me. Then he asks, as we've been seeing through the series, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? More complaints in his prayer. Not just about the confusion with God, but frustrations within his own heart and struggle with deep depressions. He says, why? He screams it even. So we see clearly here in this lament psalm, both coming to God and bringing the trials and struggles and complaints even to God in prayer. Do you see it now? Right in the Bible, this is a biblical practice. And there are many, many other places in Scripture that show this in different situations. Do you lament? 
Do you bring your problems and worries and anxieties and sadnesses and sufferings and complaints and trials and even despair before God? If not, why not? And if not, why not now try to follow Scripture and lament in these troubled times that you go through? It's biblical. Look with me really quickly at the rest of Psalm 42, now starting in verse 7 and going through the end of the psalm. 42 in verse 7 says this, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So we see more here in Psalm 42. For instance, the psalm is mixing both complaint and even hope in his regret requests for help, these desperate requests. And also he adds in here his trust in God. I want you to see here the very fact that the psalmist comes to God in prayers shows that he trusts God. But then him making his complaints known over and over throughout the Psalms means that he believes that God is sovereign and in control and can help him, which is why he's complaining to him. You see, his complaints then turn to trust, as we saw. God wants you to come to him in prayer with your suffering and sadness and struggles. Dear saints, he knows them. So he wants you to tell him in prayer your complaints and struggles. He's God. He can hear those things. He knows those things. He wants you to pour your heart out to him. He's your heavenly father. Literally, what he's calling you to do, dear suffering Christian friend. He's your good father. Tell him how sad you are if that's you or how distressed you are, or how downcast you are, even how despairing of life itself you are, if that's you. He's calling you to him in these laments as exemplified all over Scripture. And also notice that the psalmist is asking the questions because he wants answers in his turmoil, doesn't he? He wants God to help him in his downcast soul experience and fear that he's going through. He trusts the steadfast love of God and knows that God is with him and trusts even to such a degree that he tells himself in the midst of it two different times, in the midst of all this sadness and difficulty and struggle, he tells himself to hope in God. Praise him for his salvation. Remember Martin Lloyd-Jones we saw exhorting us to speak to ourselves not let ourselves get us all down only and confused. And I hope you can see here, the psalmist does just that and shows his trust in God. The process of lament includes complaints, but if we stay stuck in complaints alone, the psalmist would have a huge problem, and, and so would we if we just stayed there. Sometimes we need to be there for a long time. Sometimes we need others to come alongside us in that time for a long time. I don't want to put a time limit on it, but at some point, the Christian is going to turn from his suffering and sadness and discouragement and complaints even and turn to God in trust. You see, he moves to trust. Listen, I know that this is not a silver bullet, just like uh, the helps that we look at last week in anxiety or the ones we looked at in depression sermons. They're not the final word. It's not going to just take everything go away from us. But I want you to see that this language is put in the Bible by God for you, for those of you who struggle with suffering and difficulties. And I want you to turn to these realities in those times as a help in your need. I want you to be free to go to God in these ways and learn the blessing of lament. 
because I know that life can be so hard. I know you can feel like you're at the end of your rope at times, but just notice that God knows that as well. And he provides biblical examples throughout scripture of people who suffered as well, who feared and who were sad and who went to God lamenting before him. I want you to be encouraged by that biblical reality. And I mentioned moments ago Mark's story and the sadness of a stillborn baby. I want to see as he found hope and grace and lament, it wasn't overnight, but it was a lifeline for him. Maybe it might prove to be a lifeline for you in your sorrows as well. And we can work through this process of lament and really deal with what has happened to us or what is happening inside of us. Use lament. God is trustworthy, but life is hard. Lament helps us to bridge that gap and create an intersection of those realities. God is sovereign, but life can be ugly and tragedies abound. Let lament help you at that intersection, dear saint. Lament your fears and anxieties to God. Lament your depression. Lament your feelings of hopelessness and despair. Lament your trials. Lament your concerns even for your marriage if you have them or worries about your children or your wayward children. Lament or lament the terrible boss that you have or the persistent health trial that plagues you or the nagging thoughts that keep you up late into the night or the terrible ways people have sinned against you or the ways that your sin has gotten you into trouble yourselves. Remember, King David lamented in the midst of his sin and experience of guilt. You can too. There is so much in a fallen world that we can learn to lament, to be helped by God as we go to him in this desperate form of prayer of lament. So go to God in these ways, dear suffering saint. Let's go to him now in prayer. Father, Oh, Father, our hearts cry out for those who are hurting and despairing here. If there are any that feel at the end of the rope, oh, Lord, would you help them? Would you mend them? Would you encourage them? Would you bring relief to the terrible experiences, oh, Lord? How long will you leave them in that position, in that place, oh, Lord? Would you bring them from it? You're their heavenly father, and you love them. You adopted them. You sent your son for them. So we pray for their relief. We pray for their care. We pray for your compassion to be poured over them. Use us to pour the compassion that you give us to be poured over them as well. Save dear loved ones here in this room and in our town and in our families. Would you save them from the clutches and difficulties of despair and discouragement. Oh God, would you do that? We trust that you can do it. We pray that you would do it. We lean to you. We make our requests known to you. Oh, and we trust in you above everything else. You are the God who loves and cares and can do all things. Nothing is beyond your power. Nothing is beyond your strength. So we trust that you can act and live and move and mend hearts today, tomorrow, and into the future. We pray all these things, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.